Hello, my name is Yuhan Sun from NYU Langone Orthopedics. Today I will be presenting the posteromedial technique for management of a tricondylar tibial plateau fracture performed by Dr. Nirmal Tejwani. Disclosures are as listed below. There was no industry support for the production of this video. A tricondylar tibial plateau fracture is defined as a bicondylar tibial plateau fracture with a superimposed posterior fragment. These occur at the posterior aspect of the tibial plateau and is typically caused by a posterior shearing force. Tibial plateau fractures have a bimodal distribution. They present in a younger population with a higher energy injury or an older population with a lower energy injury. The tibial plateau is a major weight-bearing surface within the body. There are numerous soft tissue structures that are in close association with it. Due to this, there is a high rate of soft tissue or ligamentous injury whenever a tibial plateau fracture occurs. If not addressed, injuries to the tibial plateau can lead to knee instability, malunions, or post-traumatic arthritis. Injuries to tibial plateaus occur most commonly as a result of either a coronal stress or an axial force. The pattern of these injuries typically occur depending on whether the knee is in a flex or extended position. As the knee goes through its physiologic range of motion, a femoral rollback phenomenon occurs. When the knee is in extension, the femoral condyle makes contact over the central portion of the tibial plateau. As the knee is flexed, it experiences a rollback phenomenon, causing the femur to contact the tibia over the posterior aspect of the plateau. If an axial force is then applied while the knee is in flexion, a posterior tibial plateau fracture may occur. The most common classification used for tibial plateaus is a Schottker classification. This classification is based off AP radiographs of the knee. A Schottker type 1 is defined as a lateral plateau split fracture. A Schottker type 2 is a lateral split depression fracture. Type 3 is a pure lateral depression. Type 4 is a medial plateau fracture. Type 5 is a bicondylar fracture. And type 6 is a metaphyseo diaphyseo dissociation. Another popular classification is a Moore classification, which can be applied to fracture dislocation variants that do not fit into the Schottker classification. A Moore type 1 is a coronal split fracture that can occur in the medial, lateral, or posterior tibial plateau. A Moore 2 is a fracture of the entire condyle. A Moore 3 is a rim evulsion fracture. A Moore 4 is a rim compression fracture. And finally, a Moore 5 is a four-part fracture. The workup of this injury starts with a detailed history and physical to determine the mechanism of injury. A thorough soft tissue evaluation should be performed to evaluate for any open injuries or possible compartment syndrome. Knee stability and neurovascular status should also be carefully documented and a secondary exam should be performed to rule out other injuries. In higher energy injuries, the suspicion for vascular damage is increased and the evaluator should consider obtaining an ankle brachial index and a vascular consult if there is concern. These patients should also be admitted and monitored for possible compartment syndrome as they can develop within the first 24 to 36 hours due to a reperfusion injury. For imaging, the surgeon should obtain radiographs including AP, lateral, and oblique view. A plateau view can also be taken with the x-ray beam angulated at a 10 degree caudal tilt to assess for any articular step off. A CT scan should also be obtained to help classify the fracture morphology. Our case is a 50 year old male with a history of a previous right IM nail performed 20 years prior who now presents with right knee pain after a 3 feet fall from a ladder. The patient was seen in the ED and placed into a bulky Jones knee immobilizer. On exam, the skin was intact. He had mild swelling and ecchymosis over the tibial plateau. His compartments were soft. He was neurointact and had strong pulses distally. Radiographs reveal a minimally displaced fracture of the medial and lateral plateau with an associated posterior shear fragment. The fracture is further complicated by a previous intramedullary nail. Further workup with a CT scan reveals a split fracture of a medial condyle, a depressed lateral condyle, and a large displaced posterior fragment. 
The goals of treatment for this fracture is to preserve joint mobility, joint stability, articular surface congruence, and axial alignment. Additional goals are to provide freedom from pain and to prevent post-traumatic osteoarthritis. Treatment options include non-operative management, an external fixation device, or open reduction internal fixation. External fixation can be used as definitive treatment for patients with open fractures with gross contamination and severely comminuted fractures where ORIF is not amenable. It can also be used as a temporizing measure for patients with severe soft tissue injury or multiple injuries. Indications for open reduction internal fixation include an articular step off of greater than 3 mm, condylar widening greater than 5 mm, ferrous or valgus instability, a medial plateau fracture, or a bicondylar fracture. With regard to surgical considerations, there are multiple approaches available, including the lateral, midline, posterior medial, and posterior approach. The goal of open reduction is to restore the articular surface. Internal fixation can be achieved with screws, K-wires, and buttress plates. For our surgical technique, the patient will be positioned prone and the fracture will be accessed through a posterior medial approach. The articular surface will be reduced and provisionally fixed. Plates will be applied in buttress fashion posterior medially and the fixation will be reinforced with percutaneous screws laterally. Final fixation will be confirmed under fluoroscopy and the wound will be closed. Patient is positioned in a prone position. Care must be taken when positioning the patient to avoid excessive abduction and external rotation of the shoulder, as this can lead to a shoulder dislocation in patients with previous instability. The arm should also be well padded over the medial aspect of the elbow to avoid an ulnar nerve palsy. The interval is identified and marked between the semitendinosus and medial head of the gastroc. The leg is sanguinated and the tourniquet is inflated. A longitudinal incision was made in the posterior medial aspect of the knee. Dissection is carried down through the fascial cutaneous plane until the fascia is exposed. The fascia is then excised, revealing the semitendinosus and the medial head of the gastroc. The semitendinosus tendon is retracted medially while the medial head of the gastroc is retracted laterally. The periosteum is then incised, revealing the fracture. The fracture edges are clean and exposed, and any fractured hematoma is removed. The periosteum is further elevated, and a blunt homin is placed under the gastroc to allow for further exposure of the fracture. Attention is first turned towards buttressing the posterior medial fracture. After reduction of the fragment, a 4 by 3 hole T-plate was placed on the posterior medial aspect of the tibia in a buttressing fashion. This plate is held in place by 1.6K wires and reinforced with a 3.5mm cortico screw. Attention is then turned to the medial fragment. The periosteum is elevated exposing a fracture and a 6 hole recon plate is contoured and applied in buttress mode fashion. The plate is then fixed with 3-5 cortical screws and fluoroscopy is used to confirm reduction of the medial plateau. Care was taken when replacing these two medial plates to not place fixation to the lateral plateau which was not reduced yet. Attention is then turned to the lateral plateau. The lateral joint line is reduced and an additional 4 by 3 T-hole plate was placed in buttress mode fashion on the posterior lateral aspect of the tibia with a combination of cortical screws and locking screws. All screws were placed around the patient's IM nail. To increase fixation of the lateral plateau, additional percutaneous fixation was used. Two 1 cm stab incisions were made over the anterolateral aspect of the tibia and two fully threaded cortical screws were then placed from the anterolateral aspect of the tibia to the posterior medial aspect. Fluoroscopy imaging confirmed appropriate placement of all hardware and maintenance of reduction. All screws were confirmed to be extra articular. The wounds were then irrigated and closed in layered fashion.
the superficial layer was closed with two Vicro and staples. Post-operative films reveal adequate reduction of the articular surface. The patient will be non-weight bearing on the operative extremity for three months. Active and passive range motion will be allowed as tolerated. Aspirin will be used for DVT prophylaxis and the patient will follow up in two weeks for a wound check and staple removal. Good results have been reported with this approach. Weil et al. performed the posterior medial approach on 27 patients and found that at a mean follow-up of 3.5 years, 75% of patients had excellent reductions. Their Oxford knee score averaged out to be 19.9 and their average range of motion was 0 to 120 degrees. There were no wound complications and only 4% of patients had an articular malreduction. Zai et al. performed a multi-plate reconstruction using the posterior medial approach on 26 patients and found that 17 patients had excellent outcomes using the Rasmussen knee functional score with the remaining 9 having good outcomes. Chen et al. also followed 36 patients with posterior medial tibial plateau fractures that underwent ORIF through a posterior medial approach and found that 94.4% of patients had a good to excellent outcome based off the Rasmussen knee functional score. In conclusion, tricondylar tibial plateau fractures are bicondylar tibial plateau fractures with a superimposed posterior shear fragment. In situations where multiple condyles are affected, care must be taken to address each condyle while limiting soft tissue disruption. A posterior medial approach with a limited lateral percutaneous incision can be used to obtain adequate fixation in these fracture patterns.